Just introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Suzanne Passman. I taught 18 years ago. I'm a homeschooler. I still teach biology today and also logic and critical thinking. Um, I'm here because science in the classroom really needs to be unbalanced. There's so much that's not being presented. Last time I was here, I explained the difference between observable science and um, historical science. And I proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that evolution is not a fact. Like she said, yes, we can prove evolution. And she says, oh, we have all these experiments. She, she talked about gravity. Gravity's in the present. You can, you can um, test it. You can repeat it. You can prove it falsifiable. A theory, anything under scrutiny has to be falsifiable under the scientific method. And when you talk about evolution, that's something in the past. I made that point last week. But let's talk about the Cambrian rock layer, where they talked about all those levels. I'm going to be just really specific. Yeah, you should find something called farm in the rock layers. As you go down the bottom, everything's supposed to be primitive. If you go up to the top, it gets more complex. You could spell the word farm, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. You should kind of see that in the fossil record. We, could, we do kind of see that in the fossil record. But you know what? They got a problem at the very bottom. Even Darwin knew about it. He spoke about it in his book, Origin of um, Species. At the very bottom, you have the Cambrian explosion. Down in the very basic rock layers, underneath all the other rock layers on top, where the fossils basically start, already there, you've got fish, amphibians, and reptiles. They weren't supposed to come until hundreds of millions of years later. Is that being taught to our students? Is the difference between her, um, historical science and observational be science being taught to our students so they can tell the difference between what's fact and what is a story or a belief? Not so much a story, but a belief about the past. Evolution is important. Does it belong in the classroom? Yes, it does. But it, we need to be focused on the evidence. What does the science say? And not censor um, things out. Now I ask myself, why are we back here again? This is the second time. But when I watch the media and I listen to them speak, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that evolution about, I'm hearing this bill promotes creation being taught in the classroom. And even when it passed the first time, I heard on WWL, you know, someone calls me up, I listen, and they're saying, oh, it's promoting creation in the classroom. I'm going, no, why are they saying this? Why are they saying it promotes creation in the classroom? It doesn't. It forbids it. And, and what they're doing is they're actually stabbing themselves in the foot because if they keep saying this teaches creationism, what are teachers, parents, and students going to think they have the free right to do? In the science classroom, they're going to follow a belief system versus the scientific evidence, the facts. And so in the science classroom, it has to be unbiased. Um, and here it is. Here's the act. It states that, excuse me, I'm getting older. This section has not been constru construed to promote any religious doctrine, promote or discriminate for or against any particular set of religious beliefs, or promote or discriminate for or against any religion or non-religion. So no matter what your belief is, it can't be presented in the classroom, whether, you're, whether it's Catholic, Mormon, atheist. Those beliefs need to stay out of the classroom. Science needs to be unbiased. Science works best when it's unbiased. And we all have that expression, if you don't learn your history, you're bound to repeat it. There's so much science that when it's non-biased and it's just pure science, technologies, um, yeah, um, just, just this whole knowledge just comes about. But when things are biased, whether it's from an atheist point of view or any bias, when things, science is censored, facts are censored, and that's when science is at its worst. For instance, Darwin, when he wrote his book, um, he published his, when he published his book, seven years later, basically, Mendel um, published his book, The Father of Genetics. It's the very foundation of genetics that we study today. But for 40 years, the facts, the numbers were ignored because Darwin had something called acquired characteristics. He believed that, that a horse or something like an animal, it couldn't reach the leaves on the top branches of the tree, so eventually the neck got longer and it turned into a giraffe. Is there any observational science to um, support that? Well, we'll hear about, oh, yes, we do see change, like in the E. coli bacteria. Oh, the E. coli bacteria. Well, one thing they love about, um, evolutionists like about E. coli bacteria is they do have they do, they can mutate in many different forms. There's many ways they can mutate. It's really neat and fascinating. Just, and, and that ensures their survival, that they can mutate. That's why bacteria are really interesting. But the interesting thing is the bacteria didn't evolve into anything other than bacteria. They're still bacteria. That's not proof of evolution. That's proof of variation. Just like we have, Darwin had natural selection, right? Artificial selection. 
everybody knew that before Darwin. You know, you could breed sheep or dogs or whatever. You have all the different types of dogs. And I've taught at the LSU vet school, and we have all these dogs, but they've studied the genetics of dogs, and not one professed, and we all know today dogs all come from basically two wolf-like dogs. But, so... Where did the dogs come from, the two wolf-like dogs? We don't know yet, but that's no reason to bring an outside belief in the classroom, um, a religious belief to the classroom. That belongs in the philosophy classroom. Let science be science. Let the numbers and the facts go where they're supposed to go. Um, 